Dijayev Akorita. You wouldn't expect me to continue in Irish. But je pourrais continuer en français. So I will settle with this other language that is very much common to ours and uh, a bit of a lingua franca when it comes to uh, talking about economics, finance, and various other things. It's a great pleasure uh, to be here um, in this proud and remarkable country, in this beautiful uh, city of, of Dublin, in these hallowed halls that have stood witness to the march of history over the course of century. I have to say that walking down the portrait gallery, I was most impressed by all these gentlemen. <laughs> but I was reassured by you, because you told me that most of them have been forgotten. <laughs> so it's all right. I would like to begin uh, by thanking uh, the Tishok. Uh, the Town OHT and uh, Ministers Noonan, Holin, Burton, Fitzgerald and Creighton, as well as indeed Governor Patrick Honohan, and all those who have helped uh, make this visit uh, and the events uh, such uh, gratifying and uh, really warm moment uh, for me and for my team. Uh, the special words of thanks uh, to you, Michael, for your kind words of introduction and for our friendship. Um, both past, present, and I'm sure future. Let me also thank the Institute for International and European Affairs, especially uh, Chair Brendan Halligan and uh, Director General uh, Dohi O'Kelly uh, for hosting us uh, today. And let me recognize the ambassadors and the representatives from business, trade unions, civil society, and academia who are present uh, here today. Ireland has always expect, exceeded expectations. When you look at the world of culture, the world of science and technology, pretty much everywhere, including in sports, which the French may have to regret tomorrow, <laughs> um, Ireland expects, exceed expectations. And uh, it's always been a country of great resilience, of determination, of reinvention, and of great humanity. Time and time again, in the face of overwhelming odds, it has bounced back stronger and more confident than before. And Ireland actually always reminds me of this uh, lovely quote by, by Nietzsche, who uh, says that what doesn't destroy you actually makes you stronger. And I think that uh, Ireland obviously epitomizes uh, that principle. And this time is no different. As uh, Tishok um, Enda Kenny put it, the Irish people have borne the burden of economic crisis with remarkable courage and patience and quiet dignity. And I believe this is testament to the enduring character of the Irish people, a character shaped by inner strength and determination, forged by time-honored bonds of trust and solidarity, a character that the great Irish writer, Edna O'Brien, once referred to as ferociously tenacious. And it's good that in the present circumstances, Ireland is presiding over the destiny of the European Union on the theme of stability, growth, and jobs. Because for those three themes to actually deliver into reality, there's nothing needed as much as shared determination towards a shared purpose, which clearly a country like Ireland can actually lead. So what I would like to talk about uh, in front of you this morning is about three themes. One is the Irish dimension. What Ireland needs to do to restore stability, growth, and jobs. Not in a patronizing way, but in a partnership way. Second, I would like to touch on the short-term European dimension. And uh, despite what the title of the speech could uh, preclude, I'm going to also tackle a third dimension, which is the long-term European dimension, which I believe must be articulated as early as possible in order to anchor whatever is taking place uh, in the short while. But let me begin with the Irish dimension. You're all too familiar with the 
rise and fall of the Irish economic miracle and how the, uh, the Celtic tiger soon gave way to a fake tiger's ghost, a bubble-driven bonanza of flax lending, mounting private debt, skyrocketing property prices, and eroding competitiveness. It was excess with little oversight. In retrospect, we can say so, without pointing the finger at anyone. And Ireland then faced the hardest of lending. You know, when people ask me about how this was manifested, well, there are a few numbers that speak for themselves. The housing prices dropping by 50%, debt going from about 25% to over 100%, and deficit going to virtually zero to above 10%, not to mention unemployment. So what responses have you found, have we found together, and what remains to be done? I think the responses to the crisis, as far as Ireland was concerned, can be summed up in one adjective, tenacious, maybe ferociously tenacious, if one wants to add an adverb to the adjective. But it has been manifested by a sense of ownership, a sense of realism, and a sense of solidarity. And I would like to touch on each of those three. <coughs> Starting with ownership, you could see from the outset that there was strong political will to implement the needed policies. The government, both this one and the previous one, took hold of the reins and never waved in its commitment to get beyond the crisis. I was a witness to that, and I have been a witness to that, both as Minister of Finance for my country and subsequently as Managing Director of the IMF. And this was always the case. What can the IMF do in that respect? Well, the IMF has been here, was here, to help, to serve our member, and we're doing this alongside the European Union and the ECB. How do we help? Well, we help with policy advice, based on pretty much 70 years of experience with now 188 countries, uh, Chairman, it used to be hardly 40, it's now 188, and it's pretty much 70 years of experience of crisis. We help with our financing, and typically we lend when others don't, to lessen the hardship during times of trouble, to help build a bridge into better days. Now that sense of ownership, which has been obvious in the case of Ireland, was doubled with a sense of realism. The Irish people knew, and their government knew, that the past was unsustainable. So they pulled together in the national interest and made the hard choices. Let's just look at the accomplishment of the past few years. What was at the root of it all, both across the Atlantic and here? It was predominantly a financial crisis, doubled in some countries, including this one, with a real estate crisis. The government began a root and branch reform of the banking system. And the reform plan was based on three key pillars, deleveraging, recapitalization, and reorganization. In other words, slim down, shed the fat, get fit with more equity, behave responsibly, in the service of the real economy. I have to point out one thing, which really is obvious to me, is that the rigor and the vigor with which that was tackled was exemplary. And the stress test, for instance, underpinning the recapitalization has served as a model in other countries. And that is really to the credit of the authorities. The government also made huge strides on the budget. During the most difficult of times, it introduced deficit-reducing measures amounting to a little over 12% of GDP, with a further 5% of GDP yet to come in the next couple of years. But that achievement is significant. To reduce deficit by 12% of GDP is pretty much unparalleled by other countries. It doesn't really show in the numbers because the situation has deteriorated so much and the denominator has gone down by a big way, but the actual reduction of the deficit is actually of that amount. And this meant 
taking tough decisions on pay, on social services, on taxes. And most recently, much to the admiration of other Euro area members, uh, the government reached agreement with the public sector union leaders on saving worth a billion euros a year by 2015. And that brings me to the third point, the sense of solidarity. The government took those decisions while maintaining social cohesion, protecting key public services, and throwing a life vest around the most vulnerable. And because of this, Ireland was able to avoid a large increase in poverty. And I believe that this stems from the cherished Irish tradition of social partnership, that social contract that I referred to. President Michael Higgins put it best when he talked about Nenyart go kur le kaila, people that grasp the deep meaning of the strength in common will, social solidarity. Now that's as far as what has been done and what has been achieved, both in terms of perspectives, principles, and actual results. Let's now turn to the future and see what remains to be done, looking at the Irish situation. The efforts are paying off, as I said. If you look at Euro area members, there are not many that actually deliver positive growth. Well, our forecast for Ireland this year is of 1% positive growth, and double that the following year. And if that wasn't enough, clearly Ireland has managed to return to the bond market in 2012 continues to do so in a smart, intelligent, well-tailored way. So despite what uh, Peg Sayers might say, the Irish economy does not have one foot in the grave and the other foot on its edge. <laughs> but while Ireland is seeing the beginning of the fruits of success, and I forgot to mention the um, employment numbers that are also beginning to show some positive numbers, first time for many years. The harvest is yet to come, and people are still swamped with debt. Household debt is 208% of disposable income, 15% of mortgages are in areas, public debt is about 120% of GDP, and has yet to turn the corner and begin to go down. Banks are making losses, and almost one in four loans has gone bad. Not to mention unemployment that is still crippling high at more than 14% and double that rate for young people. <clears throat> so we see three key priorities ahead in order to actually move forward and get over those negatives that I've just mentioned. Working out private debt, one, delivering efficient and effective public services, two, and reducing unemployment, three. And all of that has to do with removing uncertainty as much as possible. On the private debt front, the key here is to work out distressed loans on a case-by-case -case basis for both households and enterprises to find a sustainable way forward for those who cannot afford to pay. Not those that don't want to, those that cannot afford to pay. And it is especially important for viable small and medium-sized enterprises that we know employ about 72% of the Irish population. What does that mean in real life? Well, it means under the calm and solid authority of central bank with appropriate supervision and traction, encouragement, to actually bring banks and borrowers together on a case-by-case -case basis to find durable solutions to the debt problem. And of course, keep bankruptcy and repossession on the table, but not center stage, over there available as a last resource, resort when there are no other options. Turning to the public sector, Ireland should strive to provide high quality public services and meet its social justice obligations to all citizens. Now that's much easier said than done. 
Because when you look at budgetary constraints, it's not an easy task uh, to do. So what's the option? Well, the option is to focus on the essential and to actually focus on the most important services, like from our point of view, because that's where you have the highest multipliers, health, education, and social protection. And by focusing on those three categories in particular, Ireland should maintain social cohesion, should do so by sharing the burden fairly and protecting those in greatest needs. That is the reason why the IMF actually supports the residential property tax, which we regard as a progressive way of reducing the deficit, a progressive way of doing it. Third, unemployment. As an urgent priority, the government must address the scourge of long-term unemployment. 14% is, is bad news, but as if it wasn't bad news enough, when you actually drill down the unemployed, you realize that 60% have been unemployed for over a year, and 30% of them for more than two years. That's what the economists then kick in, where they kick in to talk about hysteresis. In other words, workers losing their skills and having been away from the job market for such a long period of time that they actually lose that ability to contribute value and to accomplish their talent. So that's where the effort has to, uh, to really focus. People need to be helped find jobs. What's the best way to deal with it? Well, clearly higher growth typically brings higher uh, employment. But in the short term, to deliver on that growth, accelerating the public-private investment projects, partly funded by the European Investment Bank, can help. Um, employment services also need to be revitalized uh, to focus on the right incentives, the right skills for the right job. Along with our European partners, we have encouraged the government to redeploy well-trained staff to this critical area. And that is something that clearly the government is very focused on and concerned about. This is as far as Ireland alone is concerned. But Ireland is not alone. Never anywhere, actually, Ireland is alone. Ireland is, is a star at bringing people uh, together, at, at reaching out, as enlarging the circle. And within that circle, clearly, the IMF will play its part and will continue to do so. But there is another much larger circle within which Ireland is actually the president, and that is Europe. So let me touch on the uh, European dimension and how the European dimension can actually support the recovery. Europe destiny is very much Irish destiny, and Irish destiny has a lot to do with Europe's destiny. Uh, Tishok actually put it so eloquently when he said, we dwell best and deepest in the shelter, never in the shadow of the others. So let me talk about what is required at the European level to, again, focus on the agenda of Ireland for Europe, stability, growth, and jobs, not just in Ireland, but across the continent, which in turn will greatly help Ireland's efforts. Because there are other Euro area members, there are other European players uh, whose numbers, whose performance, whose unemployed are in a far worse situation than that of Ireland. Now, a lot has been done, and I want to repeat and reiterate that what the Europeans have done together in the last four or five years exceeds vastly the fears or the expectations that people had about Europe. Wherever you turn your eyes to, European stability mechanism, the ECB outright monetary transactions, the agreement to reduce Greece's massive debt burden, the six-pack directive, the two-pack directives, the significant improvements to the financial regulation frameworks that is still not yet completed, but that is moving fast. All of that are huge achievements of the Europeans. And uh, Ireland 
with its presidency is on the way to actually delivering more and better than what was expected. However, these achievements, these significant changes that I'm sure my predecessor, Mr. Van Rompuy, has commented upon, are not yet translating into higher income, better jobs, and more growth. So all of this might be helping markets, and they're doing fairly well at the moment, thank you very much. But it's not yet helping the people, which is what actually matters at the end of the day. And the underlying problems at the European level are pretty much similar to what you've encountered, lingering high debt of households, banks, corporations, and government, and the needed deleveraging and sanitation of some of those balance sheets. And in these circumstances, macroeconomic policy can help support demand. This is particularly important for Ireland, and why is that? Because the recovery is probably going to be essentially driven by exports, which can only be sustained by adequate levels of demand in partner countries. And clearly, the European Union, whether it's the UK or partners in the Eurozone, are immediate and first destinations for those exports. What does this mean in practice? Well, there are two levers that can be used, essentially. One is monetary policy, the other one is fiscal policy. In our view, monetary policy should remain accommodative, and we believe that there is still some limited room for the ECB to cut rates further, as and when it considers that it is needed, because it's an independent body, as should central banks be, but we note, we note, uh, that, <laughs> that there is a little bit of that limited room. Going further, and that was adventurous and necessary on the part of the ECB. The outright monetary transactions can help monetary policy work better. The coined expression is good monetary transmission, number one, and number two, the principles of that are clearly rooted in actually rewarding, encouraging, and certainly not putting additional weight on countries that are actually delivering on their fiscal consolidation and structural reforms programs. So we believe that when countries are on the right track, they should also receive support to help them regain market access and reduce dependence on official assistance and regain market access at rates that are considerate and that are in close relationship with its economic and fiscal performances. That's for monetary policy. Fiscal policy is trickier. With public debt so high in many of the Euro area and European countries, the direction has to be, has to be down and not up. There's no question in our mind about that. But how fast should it go down? The pace is going to be critical. We believe that the pace should be measured and steady because it will strike the right balance between putting the books in order and supporting the recovery. Measured and steady also means coming up with credible medium-term plans with durable measures and sticking to them rather than focusing exclusively and predominantly on the headline deficit targets. In other words, more structured rather than nominal targets will certainly help out in the current circumstances. We believe that the current fiscal framework in Europe as enough built-in flexibility now to get the adjustment right. There is flexibility in the, in the pact as adjusted to accommodate and facilitate that measured and steady path that uh, we would recommend. Another point, when we talk about uh, demand, we have to consider and we have to accept and we have to actually talk about it the fact that demand is unbalanced across Europe. 
much stronger in the north than in the south. And much of this reflects relative competitiveness problems. Now, restoring a sense of balance means what? Not losing competitiveness. This is not the point. It means lower inflation and wage growth in the south, but it also means allowing somewhat higher inflation and wage growth in countries that can afford it, that are predominantly in the north. This too is an aspect of European solidarity. One more thing, we need to make sure that any spark to demand fuels sustained growth. This means reforms to boost the supply capacity of the economy. The IMF has done some really interesting work here, focusing particularly on Europe and you know, how growth can be encouraged. And we found that large-scale product markets, service market, labor and pension reforms across Europe could boost the level of output by about 4.5% over a period of five years. And of that 4.5% potential additional output, about a quarter of that flows directly from the effort being conducted in a collaborative and cooperative manner. So that's European solidarity actually bearing fruit. Now, you've, you've heard me say that, particularly on the fiscal policy, it's not a question of one-shot measures, short-term and sustainable uh, decisions, but durable measures that are actually well anchored into the medium term and the longer term of, of Europe. That's what I would like to finish with. Building a stronger Eurozone is actually critically important to optimize and leverage the efforts and the sacrifices that are being made in the short term. Because in many ways, the European economic crisis was a crisis of incomplete integration, of unfinished architecture, if you will. The Eurozone was a close-knit club, but not a solid community. It was linked by bonds of loose or not so loose fraternity, but it was not a family. It was a collection of well-functioning parts, but not a harmonious whole. We had a single market, a single monetary policy within the Eurozone, but dispersed supervision of banks and limited fiscal integration. I'm not going to talk a lot about fiscal integration, fiscal union, because that would require another good hour of our time. I'm going to focus on banking union, which we regard as a priority. But we believe that while some are raising the threats and the spectrum of protectionism and of populism, now is a time when there is actually an opportunity to go the extra mile, to move the ball further, and to actually deliver on real, solid, sustainable architecture for Europe and particularly for the Eurozone. To bring to mind something Nobel laureate Simus Heaney once said, apologies for not saying it very nicely because I'm going to apply it then to banking union, which I suppose you would hate. <laughs> but I think it's beautiful and I can't resist it. Once in a lifetime, the longed for tidal wave of justice can rise up and hope and history rhyme. Believe that a further shore is reachable from here. As I said, apologies for trying to apply this to banking union, to a single supervisory mechanism, to a resolution scheme of a European nature. But let's look at it. With a fragmented system as it is, and Governor, you, I'm happy to be contradicted by you, if you will. But the fortune of banks are tied to sovereigns. And the fortunes of sovereigns are tied to banks. And if one goes down, the other goes down too. Here in Ireland, you've paid the price. You saw how failed banks can actually overwhelm the government, lending to a ruinous sovereign bank, real economy, death. Not death, but very nasty loop. A functioning banking union, on the other hand, 
severs the link and cements stability. It ends fragmentation and makes monetary union more effective. It works against the buildup of concentrated risks. It stops deposit flight. Because there's no point about this flight if there is a banking union. And it makes monetary policy work better. We've seen it in other monetary unions that have worked in the course of history. It is also an issue of solidarity. Banking union means that troubled bank banks become the responsibility of all, not just one. You see this in Ireland. Yes, Irish banks borrowed too much and were not as well superv supervised as they should have been. But if they borrowed too much, others lent too much. And without the appropriate degree of caution, of due diligence, of verification. So it's two sides of the same coin. And we need co-responsibility, starting with what will prevent that from happening, which is common responsible supervision on a pan-European basis, and particularly on a pan-Eurozone basis. It is important to actually implement that single supervision mechanism centered at the ECB. And there must be clarity on its duties, on its powers, on its accountability, and on the separation between the various functions. And it must have the resources to actually do the job that it is tasked to do. Will that be enough? No. It also needs a single resolution authority that can actually restructure or shut down problem banks in a timely manner at the least cost, including by sharing the burden with the private sector where necessary. It needs a common safety net, such as a common deposit fund, to sustain confidence. And it needs common backstops to deal with systemic problems across borders. If all of that is put in place, this package should be able to actually severe, eliminate that poisonous cord between sovereigns and banks. But while this makes the future safer, we still have to deal with the past that has been left from the crisis. Troubled banks that are not systemic can be handled at the national level. But what about systemic troubled banks, which might be too big for any one country to handle? Well, here, direct recapitalization by the European Stability Mechanism, the famous ESM, could play an important role. That issue is not settled yet. Our view is that it would be one of the good users of the ESM. It would share the cost across the membership, with heavy lifting to be done. 17 pairs of hands are better than one. This is particularly relevant for Ireland. Direct recapitalization of the viable Irish banks can lower public debt by switching some debt owed to Europe with equity and help insulate the government from further potential drain if the economic situation was to get worse. This would also help the government and banks access market on better terms. Now, I have deliberately focused in that latter part of my address to you on the banking union. There's also a lot to be done on the fiscal union front. But clearly, quite a bit of work has been done. And it's a balancing act between prevention, precaution, and actually intervening and sharing liabilities. I will come back, Chairman, to address those issues another day. But ultimately, deeper integration would lead to a stronger, safer, and successful economic and monetary union. And that is surely in the interest of Ireland, but it would be in the interest of all in Europe. So let me conclude. Ireland's strength has always flowed from its openness to the world. From the earliest of days, this small nation has made a huge mark. And this openness to the world is clearly taken on board by the current government in its European presidency. Reopening the chapter of the EU-US trade relationship is certainly one demonstration of this attachment to openness. 
At a time when Europe fell into darkness, it was Irish monks like San Columbanus who kept the flame of learning alive. And from the time of the Industrial Revolution, it was Irish ingenuity that built the roads, the railways, the laboratories and the skyscrapers in lands far from home. I was always told when traveling from Paris to Le Havre, when I was visiting my grandfather, that actually the first railroad in France was not built by the French, it was built by the Irish, because I was asking always, why is that? My father would always say, yet they knew better. <laughs> and after a period of isolation, visionaries like Takey Whitaker paved the way for a great reopening of the world as Ireland forged a new destiny within a united Europe. The Irish have always been visionaries. They've never been afraid to dream big. It was William Butler Yeats who said, I have spread my dreams beneath your feet. Treat softly because you treat on my dreams. Over the past few decades, the dream of a dynamic, prosperous, confident nation became reality. And today, despite grave setbacks, this dream is still very much alive, except that it can be rooted in more realistic, more responsible grounds. It was Yeats who also said, in dreams begin responsibilities. And those responsibilities are the core responsibilities of Ireland and Europe. Shared determination towards shared destiny. Gorev mida mo agwiv. Before we start the question and answer session, um, just to remind you again about telephones, that they are switched off. And just to say to those who are looking in on the web that we are carrying on the question and answer sessions immediately, uh, and that all these proceedings will be on the record. Uh, I want very briefly on your behalf to thank Madame Lagarde for that address. I can tell you that I will immediately take up the invitation for you to come back here again. <laughs> We have a big agenda, uh, and just to say, as I mentioned to you briefly uh, before we came in, we have a project, a big, the biggest project we've ever run in the Institute in 22 years, which encompasses pro a banking union as a separate project, fiscal union, separate, economic union, separate, and political union, which in a sense is over, overarching, and also looking at the principles and values of Europe. So we hope to do this by tomorrow afternoon. <laughs> now, I'm very much open for uh, questions and or comments. And um, you would please stand up for the, uh, for the cameras when you do so. And please give your name and uh, also any organization which you may have the good fortune to represent. And I will, the day being in it, I have to warn you, give preference to women. <laughs> I'm going to start. Therefore, here, in this row, please. My name is Audrey Dean, and I represent the St. Vincent Paul Society for Social Justice Function. It's a Catholic lay organization of 9,500 members, and we are based in almost every parish in Ireland. And bonjour, madame. Vous êtes la bienvenue à Dublin ce matin. I'm delighted to hear you speak about humanity and dreams and warmth. But I'm very sorry to tell you that on behalf of the 9,500 members who visit homes in Ireland, we are seeing increased stress, increased hopelessness, and increased despair. We understand economic and fiscal consolidation, and we're delighted to hear you say and acknowledge that there has been a lot done. But, and I'm delighted to hear you talk about very, very important, critical public services. We live in a country where we have absolutely no after-school care and in which we have very shaming health inequalities related to income and bad access to services. So my question to you on behalf of my organisation is, given the two not reconciling agendas of the social investment paradigm in Europe 
and your organization's interest, understandable of course, in consolidation. How do you suggest that we continue or at least try to you know, work that out because we're seeing a lot of distress and we're here looking for leadership from your organization. Thank, Thank you, you very much indeed. Okay. Well, I would, I would number one, recognize uh, what you said about the hardship and the difficulties and the, uh, the lines that are getting longer and uh, the people that do not have a job or, you know, wonder how they're going to uh, end the month and, and, you know, get by without paying bills, because that, that is the day-to-day uh, the -day reality. You know, equally, the problems have to be sorted out, they have to be fixed. And I think that the, the, the honest answer on my part is, is twofold. One, there cannot be a degree of fiscal consolidation that strangles growth and hope to the point where it actually destroys, damage the social fabrics. That's point number one. And that's the point I was trying to make when I said, you know, measured pace of fiscal consolidation. No household, no company, no nation can live on constant debt and increasing deficits. So that has to be cured, that has to be addressed. It's a question of how fast you do it and how sensible you are when doing it. And that takes me to my second point. There has to be you know, enough safety nets so that people that are most in need actually have the support and have the protection that should be awarded to them. And, you know, more and more, particularly in a dialogue with the authorities, we try to identify, you know, how are you going to reduce pensions because pensions are way out of line compared with the uh, European average? Are you going to hit universally across the line or are you going to design it in such a way that it hurts less the small pensioners? And that's the option that we would prefer. But clearly the, you know, the only answer to all that is to actually finish that moment of hardship and get on with actually creating value, developing uh, jobs, being able to invest and, and to you know, do that then in a measured, sensible, balanced way. Not, not get you know, ahead of ourselves yet again and, and borrow and, uh, and, and you know, have just yet again too much debt, too much deficit on, on, on our books. Okay. Now, okay, Ronan. Ronan Tynan, Agus Keshgarad, Anagarad, Ronan. He's very good at questions, but he gives very long questions, by the way. And I'm warning him in Irish, <laughs> very short. Anagarad, that. Uh, Ronan Tynan, a member of the Institute and co founder of Esperanza Productions. I, I'm delighted that the first speaker to address or to ask a question was from the St. Vincent de Paul, because I think anybody watching in from Ireland is suffering. Uh, to some degree of this austerity programme, most of all the disadvantage. And when you praise the residential property tax uh, with the political cost to the parties in government, I think it's important that you are reminded of the extreme pain this programme is causing to people in this country at all levels. Because when the politicians uh, and the regulators have allowed the banks and the developers to destroy the economy, everybody was over, well, most people were overborrowed, and their retrenchment is, Ronan, is really Ronan, causing problems. That's not a now, question. My, sorry, Mr. Chairman, and you are right, it's not a question statement, but just a very brief fundamental question. And it really annoys me, though, the willful failure Ronan, of the... Ronan, uh, just, Ronan please. Please, oh, yeah, yeah. please obey the chair, please. A question. A very brief question, Mr. Chairman, thank no, well, you. Well, that'll be, that'll be a change. No, a, a, a fundamental question about the misunderstanding of economics by the ECB and surplus countries. You've touched on something fundamental. If we do not have demand in the economy, deficit countries cannot resolve it. I would put it to you, it's your responsibility to lecture surplus countries in reminding them you cannot have equilibrium unless the surpluses come down to okay. address the deficits. Demand is fundamental and it is one of the big missing factors. Okay. All of this pain may be in vain if we do not stimulate demand. Thank you, Thank very, you very much. much. Thank you, Ronald. That's, would you like to? Well, I'm not sure there was a question about it. Um... <laughs> Mark, Mark Coleman here. August Keshkar of Brendan. Uh, but I think, as uh, Madame Lagarde 
Uh, Dick Giver gave us the courtesy of saying something in Irish. I just like to say, personnellement, uh, je suis désolé que vous n'étiez pas le candidat dans les élections. Uh, vous, vous ne pouvez pas répondre. Uh, et au jour international des femmes, uh, j'espère que ça va changer. Uh, you don't have to respond to that. Um, that's just uh, say, say entre nous. Uh, the question which is short. The question which is short. Um, the IMF was founded as arising from a deep monetary crisis. You said this crisis is a financial crisis. You're head of the World Bank, effectively, a World Bank, but we don't have a World Central Bank. Would you agree that the problem is loose monetary policy? And if I may use one more term of French, we are in a cul-de-sac. You say cut interest rates. Interest rates are already negative. The whole problem of this crisis is that central banks spent three decades lowering interest rates. We are now in a liquidity trap, and it won't work. That's question number one. Question number two. We have 56% of GNP going on state spending. That's the same as in France. We have nothing like the level of French public services. Would you accept, Madame Lagarde? The problem in Ireland is the chronic lack of efficiency of state spending uh, and the chronic pressures it's putting on the private sector, particularly those of us who do not have secure employment or pensions in the public sector. Thank you. You know, we, I think we have different views about that. Uh, when when you, you talk about the uh, accommodative monetary policy and the liquidity trap, uh, we take the view that the accommodative uh, monetary policy is actually a necessity at the moment. It, it, in and of itself, it would not be sufficient. But given the limited space that is available for fiscal policies at the moment, we see no option but for the monetary policy to actually take the baton and run with it while those that are implementing fiscal policies actually redress the situation of public finances and find you know, the, the room uh, with which to actually stimulate the economy and make uh, economic actors uh, capable of investing, capable of hiring, capable of creating value. So I, I'm, I'm afraid that I don't... Uh, I don't agree with you on the uh, issue of monetary policy. They cannot do that on a, on a, on a constant, forever uh, fashion. They are really clearly taking the baton, running with it for a while until the others can actually do the job. And they will have to gradually, over time, either by matur maturity or, or by, you know, attentive, subtle releasing uh, of, uh, you know, by how much their balance sheet has significantly improved over the last two years, which is big for some of them, uh, they'll have to come back to a more sort of conservative uh, monetary policy. Uh, on, on your second issue, you know, clearly uh, when there is a significant withholding uh, by the state, uh, the government has to make the best use of that resources to actually deliver services that are of value to the population. My call was to actually ask that there be a focus on what is the most efficient from our perspective. It's health, education, uh, and um, employment policies. I'm sure that there is a will and a need to actually improve that, uh, but I was more talking about the focus of where money should be spent, uh, bearing in mind that spending cuts are also in order and have been in order, as demonstrated by the, uh, the two governments. Okay. There's a lady over here who's been very insistent with her hand, <coughs> and then I'm going to, and then I'm going to go to Alan Jukes, and then there's another lady right to the very end of that row because I'll come back to you. Okay, thank you very much for your cooperation. Siobhan Adinahu, and I'm. Um, Could you stand up, please, for the camera? Siobhan Adinahu from the National Women's Council of Ireland. The IMF a number of years ago did some very interesting research, which showed that income inequality was probably one of the causal factors for the. The, the global crisis that we find ourselves in. And I'm just wondering about uh, your priorities and why it isn't maybe a priority to reduce income inequality as a part of the solution of Ireland's recovery. And what do you see as essential um, in, in reducing income inequality? And also, I want to wish you a happy International Women's Day uh, from the women of Ireland. And I hope that you remember that it's women that's bearing the brunt um, most severely for the austerity and the uh, deep crisis we find ourselves in and that it will be women who will find our way Thank forward you. as well. My, my wish is reciprocated to you a million times and to all women of Ireland and elsewhere. Uh, yes, and I'm, I'm very much aware that uh, 
women tend to bear a much higher burden uh, in, in, in tough times. Now, the issue of income um, inequality is something that we, we have studied, including uh, very uh, recently. And certainly, the outcome of those uh, research demonstrate that with better income equality comes more sustainable growth. That's the key findings from that study that you probably referred to. And, uh, and that is clearly something that you know, governments in the design of their policies have to take on board. If, if they want more sustainable growth, then certainly better income equality, less disparity, including you know, with the, the top of the last, uh, um, not decile, but uh, hundreds of deciles relative to the uh, lower quantile, uh, has to be uh, reduced. Um, that, that's, that's clearly empirically demonstrated by that, by that work. Alan Dukes here in the front, former Minister for Finance and former President Alan Dukes, a member of the Institute. Uh, you have spoken, Madame Lagarde, of the need for fiscal coordination and solidarity in the sense that the stronger, the fiscally stronger member states of the Eurozone should play a bigger role in stimulating demand. You have spoken of the need for solidarity and I think mutuality in the context of banking resolution where that's necessary. Uh, and that's been, I, I think, um, a leitmotif in the IMF's approach to the current crisis uh, for some time. May I ask if you're making much progress in bringing Chancellor Merkel around to your point of view? You know, it's been a tradition of mine to annoy uh, some of the uh, readership. Um, I did it when I was finance minister. I'm still doing it as um, managing director of the IMF. And uh, I think in, in the interest of all, a more balanced model uh, is, uh, is desirable. And uh, I will not renege on that, and I will continue to say so um, until I'm heard. The mic is over here, this lady in the middle of that particular row. Maybe you, perhaps you might stand up again and let us know who it is you are. Thank you. Yes, thank you. My name is Nolene Blackwell. I work with the Free Legal Advice Centre, the legal rights NGO, where we have a big focus on people who are struggling and who are coming to the end of that ferocious tenacity that Irish people have when they deal with their debt. Um, and you mentioned among your solutions the, the fact that uh, banks will deal with borrowers in debt on a case-by-case -case basis, and they must come together. But Madame Lagarde, as you know, the power imbalance between the borrower and the bank is enormous. And I suppose my concern would be, um, uh, would be to ask the IMF to ensure that the correct resources are in place to allow people to have some just solution, not just a solution, so that there is justice for those who are in debt right now. <coughs> Which is, brings me to the second and final point. You also talk about the need for solidarity. I have read much of what the IMF has written, not just about Ireland, but about its other countries as well. And I know that the IMF recognizes the fundamental need to preserve human rights as a basis for the rule of law and for stability and solidarity. And I would ask again that the IMF would be our anxious scrutineer, our ambassador of conscience, another phrase of Seamus Heaney, um, that you would be part of our ambassador of conscience in ensuring that any reductions in the needs of the most vulnerable are met in a way that is consistent with fundamental human rights. Thank you very much indeed. It's too much and too big a title to be ambassadors of, uh, of, of conscience. Uh, I think, you know, we, we have a mandate. We need to do our job. We need to do that as even-handedly as we can and conforming uh, with the rule of law. Now, that includes, you know, honesty, focus, uh, relying on what has worked in the past, and clearly having people as the ultimate, of, ultimate focus of what we are recommending. Uh, we don't only look at the current account balance. We don't only look at monetary policy. We try to see how the combination of all policies actually aim at 
delivering what is needed most, which is jobs, which is growth, which is um, uh, an improved well-being uh, for people. You know, it's, it's up to the national governments uh, and uh, the monetary authorities as well in their supervisory capacity uh, to actually make sure that the right approach is taken, that the right tools are available, that they're used uh, with respect, with dignity, and uh, I have full confidence that that will be the case in Ireland. I'm taking words out of you, Michael, maybe. Yeah, Patrick. Okay, Deputy Mitchell O'Connell. <coughs> Deputy. Thank you. Uh, Mary Mitchell O'Connor, Fine Gael TD, and one of 25 women elected to Dáil Éireann that comprises of 166 members in all together. Madame Lagarde, could you comment today on International Women's Day on gender quotas and, and in helping to bring more women into political life and onto public and private boards? Thank you. You know, I can be either brief or long on that one. Um, I'm all in favour of it. Um, I, I'll be just a bit longer so that she understands my position. When I was a young girl out of university, I thought very proudly that we should be hired, elected, chosen, uh, promoted on our own merits and that uh, quotas were an offence. Well, I've learned. And I think that to actually close the gap, which is far too big, Quotas are needed for a period of time. They're not needed forever because I have trust in us and I think that we can convince that yes, we deserve to be included, to be promoted, to be respected, to be heard, to be elected. But that gap is too big not to be closed by the efficiency of quotas. Okay. Now, does it <coughs> here, is Olga, is it? <coughs> Please stand up again and tell us as soon as you are. Bonjour, madame. Bonjour. Uh, um, my name is Olga Barry. Um, I'm here in a private capacity as a member of the Institute. Um, I work in Brussels, and Europe really wants Ireland to succeed. All the goodwill in Europe is behind Ireland, and they're with a view to hoping that we prosper well. Un in Ireland, unfortunately, it seems that Irish citizens do not have such a positive view of the IMF and the EU and of the Troika. And I'm wondering, could you envisage a time where Irish citizens may view your stop in Ireland for these number of years in a positive way? Thank you. You know, I'm, I hear what you say, but, you know, we are not here, we're not anywhere in the world to be popular. <clears throat> we're here to be partners, to hold hands and to make sure that together with the country that has asked us to interfere and to help, we go across that um, moment of hardship, of sacrifices, of difficult times for all. So by necessity, because when we step in, the situation is not good. What should have been done has not been done. Or the crisis has impacted where nobody expected it. So when, when we... When, you know, no country calls the IMF out of pleasure. Uh, countries call us out of necessity. And what we do as professionally as we can, as uh, honestly as we can, is provide the advice, provide the support, provide the lending that will help that country and its people go through the period of hardship. You know, I will tell you something. It's been very interesting to me to actually visit some of the countries that uh, requested the help of the IMF some 10 years ago, five years ago, uh, whether it was in Latin America or whether it was in, in Asia. And so in some of those countries, the IMF's role and the recommendations at the time were resented because of those reasons, because it, it, it's, it's hard. But subsequently, 10 years down the road or five years later, the people, not just the governments, but the people, was saying, thank goodness you were around. Boy, we didn't like you at the time, but thank goodness you were there. And we're pleased that you said the things that you had to say and really engaged us on, on what was a, a tough road that maybe we wouldn't have embarked on had you not been around. 
And I dearly, dearly hope that this is the case with, with Ireland. And I dearly hope that my Irish friends, colleagues, uh, do not resent me for too long, if they resent me at all. Okay, um, second last question is going to be Martin, Martin Manser, just here. Stand up, Martin. And I'm, I'm afraid we're going to have to close off after okay. this. Um, <clears throat> Madame Lagarde, um, oh, we, we met, uh, as you probably remember, I was a junior minister in finance and uh, greatly respected your role uh, during the 2008-2010 period. My question yes. is, um, you That's spoke true. of, um, uh, if you like, irresponsible uh, borrowing, uh, which was certainly a major cause of our problem, but you also referred to irresponsible lending. Um, there would be a feeling in this country uh, that, uh, at least as far as Ireland is concerned, uh, uh, the irresponsible um, uh, lenders uh, from outside this country, uh, you know, have been uh, protected uh, in the solutions that have been adopted. Uh, do you feel there are um, any obligations um, uh, that uh, they face or should face? Thank you. Um, yes, I do recognize you and, uh, and remember you well. We cannot rewrite history. I think everybody knows for the record what the position of the IMF was. Um, that hasn't changed. And I think that the, the key now is to look into yeah. the future, work forward, rather than looking in the uh, rear mirror and do everything we can to actually make sure that that future is going to be bright and is going to be light. Not light in terms of regulations, light in terms of burden. Okay, last question is going to be placed by this lady here, just in the middle there, yeah? Yeah, you've been, would you mind standing up so that I can recognize the fact? Yes, indeed. And I apologize to everybody else because there are so many people offering and it really is impossible to conclude on time. Thank you. Thank you, Madame Lagarde. Um, I'm a final year student of European studies in Trinity College down the road. Um, and when I finish my exams in May, I'm facing the high levels of unemployment, of youth unemployment that um, you mentioned. So I just wonder, could you, could you comment on how exactly we can tackle youth unemployment both in Ireland and in Europe because it's so high there as well? Thank you very much. You know, the, the, um, there is no magic stick. Um, and and it's, it's a fact that at the moment it's just hard. And I have two, you know, 24-ish sons um, who are in the same position as you. <clears throat> and it's hard to get a job and it's hard to enter the labor market. Um, I would say that if you have chosen these European studies, uh, you probably speak different languages, not just your own. Uh, well, I would say your own, your two owns. Um, <laughs> and that, that certainly gives you uh, an, an additional asset uh, because you can be probably more mobile than many other people. Uh, if you've studied um, European studies, uh, you have faith in that much larger environment of ours and there are and there will be countries that will sort of pick up a little bit earlier than others. Uh, but clearly, all European governments together have to focus on what will actually help young people to access the job market. And there are multiple policies in place. Um, you know, some of them have been uh, tried. They don't succeed necessarily as, as well as one would hope. Uh, I think we all have to just bind in this together to make sure that growth actually picks up is better, the fruits of growth are better shared. And that comes back to the point of, of income inequalities and the sharing of the fruit of growth. And uh, whatever you can do to actually join the job market, I'm talking to you as I would talk, as I, as I talk to my sons actually. I said, forget about your diplomas, forget about you know, hitting that level of that salary, just get in there and work your way up. Um, there's no alternative to actually you know, hard work and, and getting stuck with it.